Gergerson rolls right. He's got a man in the end zone. Oh, it's picked off! Oh, my God! Number 21, Ryan Dickey! With the play of the night! I'm going to go a step further, Jake. That's a play of the year for Murphy. Oh, my gosh! Yes, sir. Wow. Hey, we got a play of the What is going on, everybody? It's time for season two of the Friday Night Press Box podcast. Uh, what what a show we've got uh, today! Uh, but man, before we dive in, uh, football is almost here, guys. What a show we've got lined up. Uh, I'm gonna start off. I'm Tim Tao, uh, Jake West, Coach John Spargo, Coach Mark Stone. We're we're gonna be the host of the show every week. Uh, we're excited to have this show on FYNTV.com and and Team FYN Sports. Uh, this show is just going to be kind of the off season. We're going to talk about what's happened in the off season, but first of all, let's do a round table and introduce everybody. We'll start, uh, with, uh, Chris, go ahead. Tell everybody, tell everybody, hey, hey everybody. Papers and football. Yeah. Hey everybody. I'm Chris Mathis. I work with 95.1, 97.7 FM and young Harris. I also cover Andrews, Hayesville, Murphy, fan and union and towns and their football season. So we're excited for that. And, I appreciate you guys joining us here again for another great year, another great season for the Friday Night Podcast. Press Box Podcast. Yeah. Uh, Coach Spargo, take us away. Hey, I'm John Spargo. work at Fannin County Rec Department. Uh, used to coach uh, some rec football at Basin and and also some high school football there. And, and I've coached a little bit of rec football at Fannin. So uh, just ready for another good football season. We'll go Jake. Yeah, I'm Jake Wesson, the director of uh, FYN Sports. Uh, glad to be partnering with you, Tim, and, and getting this season two underway. I hope North Carolina and Georgia and Tennessee all play football at the same time this year. That'd be nice to see. <laughs> <laughs> sure would make it easier on all of us. Glad to doing that. Coach Stone, he don't need no introduction, but here he is. Uh, Coach Mark Stone, uh, been in coaching for 40 years, retired last year. Just, uh, just a great experience. Last year was a great experience. I look forward to this and uh, look forward to high school football being, uh, being real. Excuse me, but uh, being real and everybody playing at the same time. And, uh, looking forward to it. Caleb Tallman from Hayesville. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Caleb Tallman. I am one of our FYN sports reporters. Uh, I also do a lot of stuff uh, with the company on the video production side. Uh, so, you know, when inevitably I screw up publishing one of these, you, you guys can blame me. <laughs> Won't point any fingers. Uh, RJ. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's uh, RJ Casey, um, big end reporter for Team FY and Sports. Uh, excited to be back on with these guys after they uh, so graciously invited me last year and ready for uh, another year of normal football. Absolutely normal football it is. And, and uh, last but not least, Wes Dunkel. Uh, Wes Dunkel, uh, 99.5 FM, sideline reporter, statistician for McMinn Central Football. Good to have Wes on the show here. Uh, we're going to dive right on into it in just a second. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, have a, a word from our sponsors here in just a second. Uh, we'll get started. We're going to talk about the North Carolina offseason, uh, the Georgia area high schools we cover their offseason, 
as well as the TSSAA uh, off-season news. So, uh, we have a training which can enhance an athlete's visual abilities within their sport. We start by giving visual tests and screenings so that our professionals at Athletic Guide can determine where a player stands concerning their optical performance. Athletic Guide can develop a comprehensive training program specific to their strengths, weaknesses, and even their sport of choice. If you want to learn more, give them a call today at 706-455-0673 or visit them online at theathleticguide.com. Athletic Guide, a proud sponsor of the Friday Night Press Box. That was uh, Athletic Eye, the official sponsor of the Friday Night Press Box podcast this year. Uh, give them a call. Uh, first off, we're going to talk about is the North Carolina offseason, uh, something that happened uh, that a lot of the Smoky Mountain Conference fans are very excited about is David Gentry uh, retiring. I know that's a big loss to Murphy, and it's a big loss for everybody. Uh, what a What a career that Coach Gentry had, and we're going to let uh, – Jake, take us away on this segment. <laughs> I mean, there's not much that I can say that has already be already been said about the man. Um, I mean, probably the best coach I'll ever see on a sideline for sure. And he he left after not <laughs> bringing home nine state championships to Murphy, um, giving Murphy an even ten uh, as a program. So. Um, I mean, they're kind of in a – Murphy's kind of in a bad spot with him leaving and with, with, with everything that's went on this offseason. But, I mean, before we really get into that, you guys want to say anything about Coach Gentry and just being able to watch him and, and, and what he's done over the years? I mean, you know, from the moment I, – I moved to Hazel when I was in eighth grade. So that's about 13 years ago now. Um and it didn't take long for me to figure out, even being a Hayesville guy, who who Coach David Gentry was. Um, on behalf of Hayesville fans, on behalf of Swain fans, Robinsville fans, basically on behalf of the whole conference. Uh, coaching against you, maybe maybe there'll be a turn for some other teams in the conference to collect a few state championships. Uh, man, what a, what a career. Like you said, Jake, there's not a whole lot we can say that's not already been said. Uh, he's in every Hall of Fame. Uh, imaginable and he deserves every bit of it um and you know he kind of handpicked his successor in, in coach watson um so it, it's going to be an interesting uh season to watch um and, and i tell you what talk about talk about pressure to be the guy that has to take over for a legend like gentry chris i know you got you oh sorry i was able <laughs> to the- coach Coach Gentry as well. I apologize. I believe my Wi-Fi is uh, not the best right here. I'm at the park, actually. But I've been able to work with uh, Coach Gentry for three years now as the sports director at WJRB, WJUL. And the guy handled every game the exact same. He walked into every game with the same mindset. We're going to win this game no matter what happens, no matter how many yards we have rushing the ball, no matter how many turnovers we have. We need to win this game. And uh, it seemed like even the state championship games, became routine. It's kind of like Tom Brady. He just knew and was familiar with that feeling of knowing this is the biggest game that I can take part in. We just have to go out there and play our style of ball. And he always stood to that and uh, never swapped up for anything until this final championship. And he, he did a little bit different there in the, in the playoff run and made a couple of uh, offensive playing calls that weren't typical of Murphy and what he had done in the past. But uh, this year I was able to build a special bond with Coach Gentry more, th- more so than the previous two years. And uh, I finally found that niche of which if I show up to practice on, I I believe it was Wednesday. If I show up on a Wednesday, he's in a great mood to talk and uh, he'll talk all day long. If you show up on Monday, he's either looking forward to uh, rewatching tape from Friday night's win or uh, looking forward to the next opponent, the upcoming Friday night. So I was really able to build a good bond with uh, David Gentry, a phenomenal head coach. And for me, it was truly a blessing so young, so early in my career to work with a guy of his stature, a guy with so many accolades and a guy that just handled business as if it was day-to-day life. Uh, coach Stone, I know as, as, a, as a former coach, uh, I know you respect David Gentry so much. Uh, just talk about what, uh, what he meant to the area and coaching in general. Well, I had, uh, I had the chance to stand across the field uh, from uh, Coach Gentry, I think four times I was, I was counting it up. Uh, we were three and one against him. 
and probably one of my most exciting victories uh, as a as a coach. I was I was offensive coordinator at Fan, and we beat them in overtime. And uh, Coach Gentry was, uh, you know, he's he's the pinnacle of coaching. Uh, it's just like Chris said, you you know, every day, every day is the same to him. Uh, you know, uh, he you know, and I. I talk to people and they'll say things like, yeah, but he had Carl Pickens. But I also saw teams that, you know, had, you know, probably less talent, but he was a tremendous coach. And he, he, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I hate it when these, these guys come to an end of their career, but uh, you know, I, I wish coach Gentry the best. And, and uh, he was, he certainly one of the best, not, not in North Carolina, but in the nation. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, Coach Spargo, got anything to add about Gentry? Well, I, I'm, we never played Murphy, so, I, I mean, I didn't get to meet him or anything like that, but everything that I know, uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's what you want to be when you become a coach. Hey, Tim, let, let, me, let me add something there. Yeah. Coach, Gentry, Coach Gentry called me one time when I was at Copper Basin, and uh, we had played we had played a couple of Nashville teams, and uh, he had he had some you know he had more problems with scheduling I'm sure than anybody, but we had played some Nashville teams, and he called me one day and he said, "Who's the best teams in Chattanooga to Nashville?" And I, you know, I started, I, I said, well, you might not want to play them. No, I, I'll play anybody. We'll go anywhere and play anybody anytime. And if you'll go back and look at those schedules, there's, there's some teams on there from pretty good teams from Nashville and uh, Chattanooga and, and, and those, those places. He didn't care. He, you know, he, he would take his, his team anywhere and play anybody anytime. You know, obviously, you know you, you got you got to play those tough schedules to get ready for the playoff run. And obviously, Gentry knew something about the playoffs. He went there uh, a lot. <laughs> went there a lot. Well, he'll he'll definitely be be missed. Uh, Jake, uh, tell us about uh, his predecessor, Joseph Watson. Yeah, Coach Watson's uh, he's from Murphy. He's been a Murphy kid his whole life. His dad coached here. Um. And and now he's he's the head coach here. Um, I think Coach Watson told me this that this is the job that he's all like he's always wanted. This is his dream job, and he's got a good support system around him with his wife Heather uh, and his two boys. Um, I think we're. I mean, Murphy's still going to be Murphy. Every time I interviewed Coach Watson last year and asked him if they were going to change something up because of who they were going to be playing next, he said, "No, we're Murphy. We do what we do. Uh, run buck sweep and." <laughs> trap everybody to death but i do think he as much as he says that he will bring a different uh kind of aura to the to this this team and he's got kellen rumfelt and peyton mccracken um best quarterback wide receiving duo in the conference um for sure coming back this year so i think he's gonna let those boys air it out and we're gonna see a, a little bit different style of murphy football uh, kind of like Chris alluded to, how, how we saw a little bit different in the playoffs last year. I think that's what we're going to see this year. But I think Coach Watson, uh, with the, the blueprint that uh, Gentry left behind, Coach Watson is not set up to fail by any means. He does have to um, find a new a, – a brand new staff, basically, um, with Thomas Nelson leaving, going to Union County, and, and Gary Thompson leaving. Um, so he's got a lot to replace. But the best part about having Joseph Watson as the new head coach of the Murphy Bulldogs is knowing his relationship with David and knowing that David is just one phone call away, um, whether that be on Friday nights or Monday mornings. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, Caleb, uh, you know, you being a Hayesville guy, uh, obviously you don't like Murphy, but I know you respect Coach Gentry. Just talk about him briefly. Um, I mean, I, I talked about him a little bit. Just it, it seems like, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of coaches have a tough time adjusting. And, and as you say, like, we're Murphy, we're going to do what we do. But 
even inside that, there, football's got a lot of nuance, and some of the coaches we have on, on this podcast and show could probably talk to it more than I can. And just because you run buck sweep and just because you trap people to death um, and, and that's what you do doesn't mean that there's not adjustments with it. Uh, and even though it looked like Murphy did the same thing for 40 whatever years that Gentry was there, he, he was the king of in-game adjustments. I mean, the, but a small adjustment can be the difference between a win and a loss. Uh, and, and he always kept people on his toes. I mean, the passing offense was always there um, when they needed it. And they, they had some teams. Uh, I remember back when I was in high school, Seth Curtis was a year older than me, one of the better quarterbacks uh, that Gentry ever had. Um, and, you know, they did a lot of read option stuff back then. Gentry always did one thing that I respect, and that's put your players in a posi- position to succeed. You know what? Like, you got your base offense, but he did all kinds of stuff to put his players in a position to succeed. You know, the coaches that don't last long are the coaches that say, this is my offense. I'm going to pigeonhole you this way. We're going to do it my way or the highway. And you know what? Those coaches in a lot of times last two or three years because they're, they're unwilling to make adjustments and unwilling to put their players in the best position. Uh, the area we live we deal with prep schools, stealing our players, those kind of things. And we're, we're in public schools. Most of us here on this podcast are all about the public schools that we cover. So you get the players that grew up here, started here in kindergarten. Occasionally you get a kid move in, move out. But you have to use what you have. And, and that's why Gentry was a legend. He used the players he had. Yeah, he had Carl Pickens, but he also had teams that won state championships that didn't have a single college player on the team. Uh, and so – more than anything, I respect his ability to adjust, even if it looks like he never adjusted. I promise you he did. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this was just my first season and getting to be around Murphy by having an opportunity to broadcast alongside Jake and Caleb. Uh, just he, he's a legend. He's a legend. And it's it's going to be weird seeing not seeing Gentry there. You know, all my life I've heard about David Gentry and Murphy, and it's uh, – it's like Jake said, Murphy's still going to be Murphy, you know. Obviously, you don't – it's it's hard to replace a legend, and Joseph Watson, I believe, is going to do a great job. Uh, but it's just going to be different seeing not seeing Gentry there on the sidelines for sure. Uh, let's move right along, Caleb. Uh, I know you want to talk about this and the rest of Smoky Mountain Conference, Jake. Uh, we've got uh, Jake McTaggart, who has transferred back into Hayesville from Towns County. Yeah, McTaggart's back at Hayesville. Um, some of the folks that may have seen the interview we did on uh, FYN, uh, Team FYN Sports Facebook and Twitter last night, um, he spent his whole time at Hayesville, you know, all the way up until COVID. And you know what? You can't blame a kid uh, for wanting to get more of a season in um, and those things. A lot of kids made those decisions, whether it was from Hayesville, a school that was especially hurt by it, um, but McTaggart went over to Towns County, actually won a state championship in basketball. Um, but the way he put it to me, uh, and you can go look at that interview, is just I wanted to play my senior year with the kids that I grew up with, the kids that I, I've been playing ball with uh, since I was little. Um, and, you know, I'll argue with Jake just a little bit. Yeah, Peyton McCracken and Kellen Rumfeld are the most proven uh, duo in the conference for the best quarterback-wide receiver combo. But um, I wouldn't be stunned if, if we get to the end of the season and Logan Caldwell and Jake McTaggart have a little something to say about that. Um, Caldwell was a young quarterback last year, got thrown into a starting quarterback position as a sophomore because Hazel's other starting quarterback that was supposed to be a senior transferred out. Um, and then, you know, he lost a bunch of his wide receivers that transferred out along with him, uh, like McTaggart and some others. Um, and Caldwell had a rocky start to the year. You could see the talent. He made some throws against teams like Robinson and Murphy um, where he would flash and you'd say, wow, this kid's got a lot of talent. Um, and then later in the season, uh, Hazel's 0-5, and, and, and a lot of teams would have given up and quit on their season. But Hazelville had a two-game winning streak at the end of the season. 2-5 uh, and five record doesn't look like much, but winning those last two games kind of propelled them uh, to want to work a little harder in the offseason and then – some things happen. McTaggart moves back to Hayesville. Um, and, and I promise you this, even though there's some really good athletes and stuff around the conference, uh, Hayes, or Murphy brings back two all-conference defensive backs. There's not a single kid in this conference, maybe not in this entire area, that can cover McTaggart one-on-one if the quarterback makes a good throw. Um, he, he's just too big. 
And, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times those big six, five, six, six kids, you think they're slow. Well, when McTaggart proved people wrong about that, that's when some of his offers, uh, D one offers started to come in is he ran a four, six, eight. Uh, I believe it was at the Florida state camp he went to. Um, and so he's got some speed for a guy, his size, but I tell you what, you roll out Caldwell, and uh, he, if he puts a good ball up there, even if you're double covering him, McTaggart's got the best shot to bring that down. Uh, and so I think you're going to see that a lot. But but along with that, um, bringing McTaggart back as a wide receiver, tight end combo, is going to open it up for a lot of Hazel's other wide receivers because if you don't double McTaggart, it's going to be an easy pitch and catch. But when you start doubling him, Hazel's going to have um, some other kids um, – they're going to be open because of that with uh, McTaggart drawing away the attention. Uh, and, and Caldwell's gotten a lot better. He, he's really put in the work this off season. I know him and some of the Hayesville wide receivers are getting ready to go down to Florida for a uh, quarterback guru camp. Uh, I, I'm really impressed with the young man that he's put in the time and effort. Um, he, he wants to be a winning quarterback at Hayesville. And there's not been many of those. Yeah, definitely. The future's bright at Hayesville. I saw they had a youth camp uh, this past week with 50 young kids there at the camp, so that's that's great as well. Uh, Jake, uh, Caleb, uh, and, and Chris can talk about this as well because they covered Smoky Mountain Conference. How's the rest of the uh, preseason uh, going? Cherokee, I believe, is uh, getting a little bit better. And, you know, Andrews, what a season they had last year. And can they, uh, can they uh, repeat and have a good season? <clears throat> yeah, Cherokee's definitely on the up and up. And, Chris, I think you would agree with me in saying that this is, pro this is probably going to be the best Andrews team we've seen in a decade. Um, they broke a lot of losing streaks last year. I, I mean, they could break even more this year. They could this, – this, I mean, they could win seven, eight games this year. Um, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, obviously, it helps that Murphy is going to be returning some star players. And, of course, as we mentioned earlier, Coach Watson has a game plan to – uh, continue with the success that's been there forever since Gentry started as head coach at Murphy High School. But it helps James Phillips and his coaching staff knowing that on the other side of things, they've got a new head coach that they have to face. And I'm sure that gives them a boost of confidence, whether they feel like they're going to win that game or not. That's one thing. But knowing that, hey, we've got a guy who's never had to make a game time decision like this, as big as this on this stage on the other sideline. Uh, I, I feel like they have a, a shot to really make some noise this year. And if they stay healthy, number one, they can really do so. I know that they have a great tailback. They had a, a couple of great tailbacks last year. Um, and one guy that uh, stood out to me was uh, Isaac Weaver. Just coming back, he's going to be a junior this season. He had over 1,000 yards rushing, 14 rushing touchdowns, led the team with 79 tackles, and also had six interceptions, which uh, led – the Wildcat defense, and he was also named honorable mention to the All Smoky Mountain Conference team. So uh, Isaac Weaver, a guy they're going to have to rely on, and then also they got a guy in Drew Martin who's coming back. He's going to be a, a junior linebacker, <laughs> offensive lineman, 99 tackles last year, one pick from that linebacker spot, and uh, he was voted All Smoky Mountain Conference as just a sophomore last year. So they've got a lot of guys, and I know that James Phillips really believes in this team and believes in the upright and, and where this trajectory shows that these Andrews Wildcats will go this year. Uh, so we'll see. I think the Smoky Mountain Conference is going to be a, a very difficult conference as usual. Uh, but I'm excited for Andrews to have a shot to really make some noise and hopefully make a deeper playoff run this year. Yeah, Chris, there's another Martin kid coming back for Andrews from injury that didn't play last year, right? He's, he's, I mean, he's, he's, his brother played, and you said had 90-something tackles. I think this the, the the other brother is supposed to be just as good, if not better. So I mean that's that's really going to help them, um, and what they can do this year. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. But I have a couple of those anchor pieces there that can step up, not only you know statistically and on the field, but also as leaders and help this young team come back and realize, hey, we can go out here, we can compete. All we have to do is believe in ourselves, trust the game plan, and execute that game plan. Yeah, Jake, that running back you were talking about. Um, his name's Austin Martin, the other brother. I remember watching him two years ago in JVs. That kid's an absolute animal. If, if he's healthy, um, he'll replace Gavin Wilson as their fullback in their offense. And, and like I said, if he's healthy, because I know he had a major knee injury, um, but he's had over a year now to come back from it, fully healthy, he may be even better than Wilson was last year in a different way. But, but pound for pound, that kid is a uh, tough run. He's a Cage Williams-style runner. Um, to use a Robinsdale kid in an example, I mean, he's an absolute load. He's one that uh, 
almost never is a single tackler going to take that kid down. He's the kind of kid that you, you put three or four kids on his back and he's going to get you those four or five yard carries every time. For sure, guys. It's going to be an exciting season at Smoky Mountain Conference. I enjoy being a part of it last year, and I can't wait to see how it unfolds uh, for the season with the addition uh, Jim, of McTaggart back to Hayesville. Yes. Before you move on, I just want to let everybody know that um, this Thursday, uh, if you want to watch some of these Smoky Mountain Conference teams in action, go to Hayesville. You come to Hayesville High School at 5 p.m. on Thursday, and um, well, I think Andrews, Hayesville, Murphy, Franklin, Union County, and Copper Basin are all going to be in action in our in our first annual seven on seven tournament. Uh, we're partnering with FCA to put that on. So if you want to watch Andrews, Murphy, and Hayesville, uh, and kind of get a feel for what to what to see this year, um, show show up Thursday at Hayesville at five o'clock, or turn on FYNTV.com at five o'clock, and we'll have live interviews and, and live stream some of those games. Um, if you yes. want, if you want to know what to expect from your team heading on, heading in this season, this would be a good measuring stick. Gonna, gonna be a great event, uh, folks. Uh, just so people know, because I, I just got off a little earlier with head coach Chad McClure. It's just gonna be a three dollar admission uh, concession stand. Will be open, uh, but you know, of course, if, if you can't make it, um, or one of the really cool things is all of our broadcasts get um, put in the archive on um, FYNTV.com. So you know, if it's a week from now and, and you miss the seven on seven, you got nothing to do. Go ahead and uh, go to FYNTV.com. Go to the archives. And you can watch some seven on seven stuff. Um, and we're going to crown our first ever Team FYN Sports slash FCA seven on seven champ. And, and hopefully, this is a uh, yearly event we do, and we'll we'll expand even more from here. Uh, but it should be a really cool event uh, for all the local teams that are involved. Yeah, it'll be a, be a great time. I'm actually going to try to make it uh, as well. So it's I'm looking forward to it as well, guys. So all right, we'll move. Uh, Right along, talk about Region 7 AA. Uh, obviously, the, the big question going into the offseason is Fannin going to be able to repeat? Uh, losing a lot of leaders on that football team. Uh, there's no new coaching changes in the, uh, in the region. Uh, every coach that was a, a coach is uh, returning for the, uh, for the 2021 season. So that is something to, uh, to, uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, leadership for Fannin County, you know, Coach uh, Mark uh, Stone and Coach Spargo and, and everybody in here, we, we, we watched Fannin last year uh, play. Can they repeat? They lost a lot. That That's that's going to be the question. What do you guys think? Well, I know they, you know, they, they have lost a lot. I'm, I'm not very familiar with this team. Uh, but one thing I always like to – to look at as a, as a coach is, you know, how does your JV team play? You know, I mean, what have you got coming up? And I know, I know uh, coach Cheatham and, and his staff will develop some kids. Uh, and I know in two years, you don't lose uh, miles Johnson and, and, and turn around and, you know, just lose those type of uh, those, those type of kids. Uh, plus, uh, your quarterback is one of the best, uh, you know, that's that's ever been through Fannin High School, and uh, and the running backs they they, they lost a lot, and uh, but I I I think this team's going to be very competitive. I, I think they're going to be in in the mix the whole way. Yeah, I, I agree, Coach. I, I think they lost a lot of, of leadership and they lost a lot of production. Um, to me, the questions are, what are you going to do at quarterback? Although Seth Reese is, is just – to see him in person, he's just a, an animal-looking guy. He's huge. Yeah. Um, I sure wouldn't want to get in front of him. And, um, you know, offensive line, you lost Micah and Bundy there and probably a couple others. So, I think I think quarterback and offensive line, like it always is, that's that's kind of where where it's going to be. But I, I think they've got a great coaching staff uh, all across the board and uh, – you know, they can scheme up different things, and, and I think they'll be fine. Yeah, I'll chime hey. in on that as well. I believe that Fannin's going to be a very good team as well. I always like to look at the coaching staff, how passionate, how determined they are to help build the program from the ground up, starting with the rec league, and obviously Chad Cheatham and staff do that. Uh, love the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator there at Fannin County as well. So uh, it's just all about who's stepping up, 
who's going to take that responsibility to be the next guy and say, hey, I want to be that guy that helps this program win. I know their secondary last year was solid. I'm looking for them to continue to be anchors this year on the defense. A couple of young guys there uh, in the slot playing corner. So I believe that this team's going to be a very good team once again. Obviously, I don't think they run the table and go undefeated in the regular season, but I do think that they're in the mix to win the uh, conf- or run the region once again. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Obviously, the big game for them, week one at home against Union County. That's going to be a big-time game and, and kind of a measuring stick for both programs. Huge, huge game. Jake? Um, I just wanted to ask Coach Stone, as a as a coach, and I mean, talking about how much fan and lost, how how did how do you as a coach, how do you think Coach Cheatham has has adapted to just telling his team um and instilling some confidence in them, even though they lost pretty much every key piece from last year besides Seth? Uh how, how what I mean, that's gotta be a tough job for a coach. Well, I, I think uh, I work for Coach Cheatham, and, and somebody said uh, he's very passionate, you know, and uh, and you got you got to take, you know, sometimes sometimes some of these guys will surprise you, and and how much they will absorb absorb and and you know work to get better. Um, I, I had a program down here at McMinn Central. We lost four offensive linemen and everybody, you know, everybody's going, uh, I, I don't, you know, we were five and five team, but we, we had those four very good offensive linemen. We came back, uh, the next year and went, uh, nine and three with, uh, with three sophomore offensive linemen and, uh, playing the same type schedule. I just think it's, it's a year by year thing. Um, I know losing, uh, uh, losing the quarterback and, and the receivers that they lost, I just I, I think I think you're going to see uh, you know a very mature uh, coach Cheatham and his staff uh, develop this football team. And uh, no, they're probably not going to run the table, or you know, but they might. And uh, I just think you you've got to take this day by day and uh, and and scheme it up, uh, do what these kids can do. And, and I think they're going to be, uh, they're going to be fine. And, you know, to piggyback off that coach, I think, I think that coach Cheatham has changed. Not that it was a bad culture, quote unquote, over there, but he's got, I mean, there, there's a sense of toughness and pride, um, Right now, and I think some of those upperclassmen that just graduated have kind of set the standard of of how we're going to practice, how we're going to work, how we're going to play. So I think that you know the younger kids are going to see that, and they're going to they're going to work to get to that point. So I think they're going to be I think it'll be a really good football team, and and who knows how good they can be. Feeding off of what Caleb said earlier in the broadcast about David Gentry making the most of all personnel, that's what Chad Sheetham does in Fannin County. I mean, he's always made sure to put his team in the right position to win and uh, makes sure to utilize every position. I mean, we saw it in that playoff game in which Seth Reese came out, first play of the second half, and was under center and threw an 80-yard touchdown to Cahutta Hyde. So uh, he knows how to dial in and how to make great play calls and how to also – uh, take advantage of the weapons he has on both sides of the field. So I think that's something you have to feel confident in if you're a Fannin County Rebel fan. You know, I, I just uh, – I don't know the rest of the region, what it's going to be, but uh, I don't think there's a better coaching staff in that region uh, that, can, that can get out of the young men uh, what Coach Cheatham and his staff is going to do. Uh, you know, replacing Bundy. You know, tough. Two years ago, replacing Miles Johnson was going. Last year was going to be tough, and, and they did it. And uh, you know, I think uh, I think you know you you were talking about Michael O'Neill, uh, Micah. You know, he's he's been a stalwart there for about you know three solid years, and uh, I think uh, I, I think they'll do a good job. I think they'll be able to to come through there and and uh, and be a super football team. Yeah. One, uh, more, one more thing, Tim, before you before you start. Ahead. I wanted to say um, they, they lost all those guys. Yeah, and you guys mentioned all the coaching staff. Um, not losing 
Coach Thigpen, who I would imagine was a hot commodity on the streets and filling some of these coaching vacancies, is – I mean, you can't say enough about how huge that is for him to still be there on the sidelines. I think you would definitely agree with that, Tim. Jake, I said that all last season. I, I, I was I was actually surprised that somebody didn't come after Coach Thigpen. Oh, they did. And, and maybe Coach Turner, uh, uh, you know. But do, who, do what now? No, no, no comment. But, but I, I do know that uh, Chris Thigpen was a hot commodity this off season. Oh, uh, I guarantee. Mm-hmm. And that's promise. that's all the respect to him. I mean, he he done such a great job this this past season calling plays, and he's a good coach with a bright future ahead of him. I spoke to some schools here in Tennessee about him. Of course, you know, it's it's tough to jump states, you know, financially, uh, you know, with with retirement and all that stuff. But I. I had some people talk to me about, you know, who who's out there that and, – and Chris Thigpen was one of the ones that I told, you know, I told some athletic directors about you ought to get a hold of him. Uh, whether they did or not, I don't know. Uh, I, I will say this about Fannin County. Losing, losing Luke Holloway, Mike O'Neill, Mason Bundy, Cahutta High, Jalen Ingram, uh, so many others, Dalton Ross uh, – and, and I, I know I'm leaving so many guys off, and I apologize, but it's going to be tough. But they had a lot coming back, guys. Uh, Seth Reese going to be a player to watch for. Uh, Corbin Davenport, uh, Carter Mann, Ricardo Arianis, Sawyer Moreland, um, Cason Owensby. How do you forget Cason Owensby? You know, just an animal on defense. Um, Carson Collis. Uh, those guys are going to be making plays. The question is leadership. You know, and, and I believe uh, they're going to find them some leaders and uh, the coaching staff speaks for itself. They're going to be OK. You know, whether they go 10 and 0, 9 and 1, 8 and 2, we'll see. A 7 and 3. Uh, it, this is a playoff team no matter what. And speaking of playoffs, something that is important is Region 7 is paired with Region 5 this year in the playoffs. Why is that important? Well, Region 5 is arguably the toughest region in AA with Callaway, the state champion, <clears throat> Heard County who uh, Fannin and Union played in the playoffs last season. Bremen is on the rise. Uh, Harrelson County. Harrelson County's got a great quarterback and a great offense. Uh, Temple. Uh, that that right there, that region is the toughest region in AA. So that is going to be – it's going to be very important to, you know, get that number one seed or that two seed for the playoffs. You know, guys, Jake, you, you said something there a while ago when, when we've talked about leadership. Sometimes when you have the leadership that Fannin had has had over the past couple of years, you know, the next group comes along and, and they they really don't know, you know, they've been led so much. And I but I, I don't think I don't think that's gonna be the problem here. Uh that you know, the the those young men, but sometimes, you know, uh you run into situations where, uh, well, what do we do? You know, how how do we be? How are we going to become leaders like like the past? Because, and I don't think Fannin's going to have that problem. I don't think that's going to be a problem for them in twenty twenty one. It's going to be very key. Somebody who's kind of stepped in a linebacker is a Cade Sands, who's done a great job this summer. Uh, him and Andrew Waldrop in case him with the linebacking core. So it's going to be interesting to see. There's a lot of hype around Chattooga right now. Um, uh, obviously, they still have the great running back in LaShawn Lester, uh, who has a UAB offer and a few others. And, uh, you know, you, you can't go on this podcast and not talk about Petrel. That was the, quote, unquote, region championship game last year in Lindale, uh, where Fannin did win. Uh, Pepperell uh, is returning a good bit too. They've got a good running back themselves, and DJ Rogers, who can absolutely fly, um, and he's back. Uh, they've got a lot of returners on offense and defense. So uh, the Fan and Pepperell game, I believe it's October first, um, is going to be a it's going to be a showdown, and it's in it's in Blue Ridge this season. Um, that's going to be the game we're going to have to uh, really keep an eye on. Uh, Model, uh, you know, they're very well coached. Coach Coach Honeycutt does a great job there. Uh, so, you know, if I, you know, we're not going to give – we're trying not to give any predictions on this show. Uh, it's hard. It's hard not to. You want to save that for later. I know Chris is laughing because he, he knows he, – he wants to say something too, but it's hard. We don't want to give any predictions, but 
You know, there's the four teams that made the playoffs this year could make could make it again. You know, Kusa, uh, a lot of good things hearing from Kusa and Dade. You know, they've got a new quarterback. I believe he's he's six foot three, and you know they, they like to sling it around the yard. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the region this year for sure. You know, a lot of people. You, you're going to have to help me, uh, Case and Owensby. Yes, you know, he he played in his brother's shadow a little bit, but I didn't think so. I, everything, every time I watched them, um, he was he was he was every bit you know the player and and made uh, made a lot of things happen for uh, for Fanon's defense last year, and I think he he's going to be a, somebody to be reckoned with. Yeah, he's he's going to be an animal this season. Uh, can't wait to can't wait to see him for sure. Uh, any 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 final thoughts before we move on? Talk about Region Eight Double A. All right. So the uh, main the main topic in Region Eight Double A, uh, Brian Allison is no longer at Union County. Uh, Michael Perry is the head coach now. Michael Perry left East Hall, and is now. Um, the new head coach at Union County. Uh, Chris, kind of take this uh, segment away. Yeah, so Brian Allison, no longer the head coach at Union County with the program and a phenomenal coach there. I, almost every year you thought at least eight and two when Brian Allison was at the helm of things. Uh, he's going to East Forsyth. Excited for him. I know that uh, he's probably looking forward to this new opportunity, and I'm sure Union is probably looking forward to their new opportunity with Michael Perry taking over the program um, and it was mutual. I know that Brian Allison's going to do big things down there at East Forsyth, and I believe in Michael Perry as well with the Union County Panther football program. But Coach Allison was one of those guys, a stand-up coach, that no matter what was going on, you knew he was going to keep his cool keep his cool in regards to staying to the course and also making the same play calls, knowing that, hey, this is our brand of football. We're going to continue with that brand of football. And he had a great group of quarterbacks come through Union County. Uh, I believe Owen B. Cole Owen B. a guy several years ago. Then you had Joe Mancuso, Cole Wright, his son Pearson Allison. A great core group of quarterbacks that uh, I feel like you truly only appreciate when they are gone because of how dangerous they were both in the passing and rushing attack. But uh, I do believe that uh, Brian Allison left behind a great program. It's not like he left behind a program that's just in complete rebuild mode. They've got several guys coming back that are going to make an impact. Uh, they've got a senior quarterback in, Logan Helcher, who looks to make that next leap this season. Uh, a couple of big-time weapons on offense as well. A guy that stands out to me is Keaton Chitwood. He's a guy that I want to watch out for and, and see him dominate. But Brian Allison, just a phenomenal coach, uh, a lot of fun to work with over the last three years. And with me being a Union County High School graduate, I actually got to see Coach Allison in the halls for several years when I was in school and got to build that relationship before I uh, worked with sports and whatnot. I always loved sports, would always go to the games. And uh, once I was able to take over as sports director at WJRB, WJUL, I was able to work with Coach Allison and, and, and kind of build that relationship in that regard and, and pick apart his brain. This past season um, was really cool. He would give me – pre-game notes. Hey, this is what we want to try to do. Obviously, don't mention it on your daily sports show, but you can talk about these things during the in-game broadcast. Uh, we're looking to run it to the right side of the field in this game. We're looking to open up the passing attack in the second half of this game. And that was really cool inside. I was very blessed that he was able to do that. It helps for a great broadcast. Uh, and I'm sure that Tim, Jay, Caleb would all agree with that. Having some sort of insight based upon your opponent, based upon what you guys worked on in practice. So uh, Coach Allison and I, we had a great bond. Once he uh, resigned as head coach at Union County, I reached out to him and just wanted to tell him thank you for all that he did for me and all the support, always joining us on the show, always willing to help out with each broadcast and uh, really just always hope the best for his guys. And I know that Michael Perry is excited for this new opportunity. It's going to be a, a new regime here at Union County High School. And things are going to be a little bit different from what I hear. But I think at the end of the day, uh, you can expect Union County to compete and always be in every game. I don't think that's going to change at all. So I wish the best of luck to Brian Allison, Union County head coach legend, as he continues his career the next several years at East Forsyth. Yeah, Brian Allison, you talk about, and I know Coach Stone uh, coached against him as well, 19 seasons at Union County, 121 and 77. That's uh, that's pretty good, guys. 
you know, uh, early, early in my career, I met Brian Allison at Furman University. We used to go to um, a quarterback receiver camp over there and uh, great guy, you know, and, and uh, they, if you, I don't know if they still do it or not, but if you want your kids to go learn the game of football, particularly quarterbacks and receivers, uh, check in the Furman University. They they wasn't no they wasn't no jokes about it. But uh, Brian's a great coach. Uh, I congratulate him for moving on. Uh, it's kind of like Chris said. He you know he's a no nonsense guy. Uh, you meet him out there pregame about five o'clock in the afternoon. He's he's acting like he's worried to death and all this and that, that and the other. And uh, but he's just a winner. And he, he truly is. And uh, I congratulate him, wish him all the way, uh, luck in the world. Yeah, so Michael Perry leaves East Hall. Uh, Chris, uh, briefly kind of talk about your interactions with uh, Coach Perry so far. They've been great. Coach Perry, from the get-go, has been willing and always wanted to talk with me regarding their upcoming football season, what they're doing this summer as they prep for their first scrimmage and also their first game as they uh, play against Fannin County on the road on August 20th. He's excited. You could tell that he he just brings a different uh, vibe to the sidelines there at Union County High School. He's amped up. He says over and over again that he's blessed for this opportunity. He's hungry to not only – Step in, and realistically, first-year program, almost entirely uh, a whole new coaching staff. You want to be realistic with wins and losses, so let's not talk about wins and losses right now. Let's just talk about the facts. He wants to come in here and change the culture. I know uh, Chad Cheatham did that at Fanning County. I think that Coach Perry wants to come in, set the groundings for the Union County Panther football program, have these guys believe, buy in, and I think he's going to try to take things slow. You don't want to overload these guys with a whole new offense, whole new defense, New coaching staff, several guys, you know, may have lost their job this offseason because they don't have that hometown connection uh, like they did with with Coach Allison because Mike P- Michael Perry is a new guy in town. He has no connection to any of these guys. Uh, so a lot of guys really have to earn their spot, even if they were the starter last year. I think they're going to rely heavily on that defense, especially that secondary. And a couple of guys, Trace Wright, Eli Pugh, Uh, And then also a new guy in Caleb John. I think those guys are going to make an impact. But uh, he's excited. Coach Perry's excited. I know that he's going to bring a different juice to the sidelines. He has this offense. They're going to try to open up that passing attack. And a couple of new formations there at Union County as well. I think that he's going to try to work with that personnel. And number one thing, he's told me over and over again, decision-making has to be at its best. He wants everybody to make the best decision both off and on the field. I was talking with him at a seven-on-seven a few weeks back at Towns, and I asked him what his number one goal is. Hmm. What exactly do you need to see today? And he said, number one, I want to see my quarterback make the right reads. Number two, I want to make sure our defensive guys are in the right position. As simple as that. It's just simple football. You go out here, you execute the game plan, and you take care of your responsibility. If it's to lock this guy down and then be aware of the rushing attack, that's exactly what you do. Do not worry about the guy to your right or your left. Focus on what you can control and uh, do your part. So um, I know that he also told me a few weeks back when he first got the job, uh, just stepping in for such a quality coach as Coach Brian Allison makes him very humbled. He's excited for this opportunity, and uh, he knows that he has big shoes to fill, like Coach Watson at at Murphy with David Gentry's absence. He knows that with Brian Allison being gone, that he has big shoes to fill again. I felt confident year in and year out before I even worked with the radio station in Young Harris. That union was a seven, seven and three, eight and two, maybe even a nine and one team every year. Never once concerned about not making the playoffs. So uh, he's going to have to have these guys believe. And again, uh, I know that Riverside Military Military Academy is back in the mix. So it's going to be a challenge this year, and I'm excited to see how things pan out for the Panthers and, and Coach Michael Perry. Yeah, and uh, Jake uh, Murph, uh, excuse me, Union also has another uh, new coach on the staff. You want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, a long time Murphy defensive coordinator Thomas Nelson left, and he's on Perry staff as the DC at Union. Um, so obviously, with those two teams playing each other this year, that's a big hit for Murphy. Uh, I'm pretty sure I was I was talking to somebody yesterday about how I didn't want to have Murphy and Union in the same pools for our seven on seven, just because 
I think Thomas Nelson could um, put his his defense in a in a place to stop Murphy every single time, just because he knows he knows uh, he knows defense that well, and he knows he knows Murphy's offense that well. So I think um, I mean that's going to be a fun matchup, but it's a big loss for Murphy losing Thomas. Um, like I said earlier, Joseph's got his hands full filling up that coaching staff again. But Chris, I know you and and Michael and and the the Panther faithful are pretty happy to see Big Thomas on the sidelines for you guys this this year. Oh, no doubt about it. I actually got to work with Coach Nelson at Murphy as well. Just a winner. I mean, on the football field, softball, the guy knows how to win. And not to mention, he's a great PA announcer as well at Murphy. He did a great job with the basketball team. So I'm hoping he might do that at Union County as well, continue with his talents there. But, uh, yeah, Coach Nelson just brings a great vibe. He wants to win. And also is very competitive. I, I hear that from several guys. I spoke with uh, Coach Perry as well. They all believe in the new defensive coordinator. And I asked a couple of the guys that I know aside from football, they were my neighbors uh, several years ago. I said, is the hype around Coach Nelson legit? And they said, there's no hype. It's legit. The guy wants to win. We all buy in. They said they bought in day one when he introduced himself to the team. So uh, Thomas Nelson – is going to do big things. I'm excited to see how versatile this defense is with Union County this year. I, I like to see how this thing really pans out because I think that he had a similar defense year in and year out with Murphy with that Smoky Mountain Conference. Again, they faced several different offenses in that in that conference compared to the AAA region that Union will see this year. So I'm curious to see how that turns out. I wonder if he's going to have a same set on defense, like, hey, this is what I've run the last – seven, eight, ten years, whatever it was at Murphy. We're going to continue that here. If it's, hey, I've got a grounding, I'm going to build off of my success at Murphy, and we're going to adjust with the personnel here. So um, I also hear that it's simple, just stick to your assignment. And uh, I, I think they're going to try to read off individual reads. A defensive back, he has a read. He knows he needs to look out for this side of the field. If this happens, this is how you react. react. If this does not happen, react in this way. So – I'm excited. I think it's going to be big for Union County. And also a change is going to be cool, too, to see how the Panthers perform out there and what Coach Nelson does in his first year as defensive coordinator at Union County High School. Yeah, it will definitely be a uh, different look on that sideline this season at Mike Caldwell. Uh, Thomas Nelson, we know, is a great defensive coordinator. I want to see what he draws up for Gunnar Stockton and Raven County when they come into town. Uh Obviously, Raven is still probably the the favorite, as they are the favorite to win the state championship. So, uh, I, th I think Nelson will have something drawn up by the time. We'll see what happens. Uh, Raven County's got a, a few transfers in too. I know they got the kid, the Gibson kid from Dawson County, that transferred in as a receiver. Uh, so, in Riverside Military, he's back now. So, you got Raven, uh, Union, Elbert, Riverside, and uh, who else am I missing? My mind just went blank. Raven Union Elbert. Who's the fifth team in the region, Chris? I'm thinking on it. Oh, man, it's not coming to my head either. Hang on. I think it'll be a, more of a challenge, obviously, this year with now Riverside Military Academy coming back into the region. Um, let's see. Who are we missing? Who are we missing? Banks County. How did Banks we forget? County. How are we forgetting Banks? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. So yeah, obviously, Tim. It used to be more or less of, hey, we've got to play Raven. Other than that, we're guaranteed a playoff spot. This year, with Riverside Military Academy coming back into things, I know they haven't had a lot of recent success. I believe they went five and two, five and five two years ago, uh, six and six three years ago, and four years ago they went two and eight. Uh, but just having them back in the mix is going to be big and. It's not a guaranteed playoff spot like it was last year. Yeah. Will be a fun region uh, to watch. Any, anybody got anything to add before we uh, talk about Gilmer and Pickens for a little bit and bring RJ back into the fold? So. RJ, you there, buddy? I'm here now. Yeah. All right, good to see you. You good mentioned. Some wide receivers transferring into Raven. Tim, you mentioned wide receivers transferring in there to Raven. Um, 
I think if I was a uh, highly touted wide receiver in the in the, in 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 this area, Ravens where I'd be going so that uh, um, Gunner could throw the ball to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think Jake's going to have some audio issues there. Um, RJ, you there, bud? Yes, sir. All right, so Coach Nelson leaves. You guys got a new coach. Well, a new old coach. Grant Myers has been on the staff for a while. Talk to us about Grant Myers, named head coach of Pickens County. Yeah, uh, as you said, Coach Myers has been with the staff uh, the last two years as a defensive coordinator. I uh, got hired as the head coach as Coach Nelson moved on. Um, coach Myers, is, as several of you uh, can attest to, Tim, and and uh, Jake can. Uh, coach Myers is, is an energetic guy. Uh, higher higher energy guy uh, wants to bring out the best in his players and his coaching staff. And I know when he talked to Jake um, during his uh, interview that Team FYN Sports had with him a couple of months ago when he got hired, um, he said he was going to let the defensive coordinator – be the defensive coordinator. He might chip in a little bit on things. He's going to let the offensive coordinator be the offensive coordinator. Again, if he sees something he may not agree with, he'll chime in and all that stuff. He, he's uh, assembled a, what I think is pretty good staff. He's got um, – he brought in two coaches from Grayson High School, which if anybody knows about Georgia football, they know about Grayson especially the last couple of years, they brought in uh, offensive coordinator and QB coach from Grayson, Aaron Nance. And they also brought in um, Jay McClonsky or McCloskey. Uh, he's going to help uh, coach uh, Sam Wigginton, who's back, uh, coach offensive line. Coach Wigginton was at the junior high last year and – Coach Myers convinced him to come back to be O-line coach and associate head coach. And uh, he also brought back uh, Adam Morton, who left Pickens after several years to go to Gilmer, be their D.C. Coach Morton's back to be the D.C. at Pickens again. And so he's, he's assembled a good staff. And I believe – what they want to do offensively uh, is a little bit more up tempo. They were always in the gun and all that stuff, but now the uh, coach Nance wants to pick up the tempo a little bit more. We saw that a little bit when they played Dawson in the spring scrimmage. And Dawson, as we know, last couple of years has been the model of consistency, you know, playoffs and high records, high marking records. And for a team that is going off new offense, new defense, and in that spring, in that springtime compaction area where they only had nine practices and, and two of them had to be in the gym due to weather. And when you practice in the gym, it's pretty much a glorified walkthrough. You can't really do – you can't really do too much there. And when you learn it and they kept up with Dawson uh, fairly well. And I was impressed to see what they did there. I think uh, what coach Myers has got, he's, he's what he also said during the interview with team FY and sports uh, is that he wanted to be a fixture in the community. He wanted to get out more. He wanted every, every time he said people saw him out, he was wearing, you know, the diamond P, the diamond green P, and all that. He wants to get out in the area, help out with the rec league, with the rec teams. And they've got a rec league, uh, they've got a rec league thing coming up later this month uh, for ages six to 12. So that's going to be a pretty big thing to get the future kids into the, into the sport and everything. He, 
it's bringing a lot of excitement and energy here, and it's especially like everybody knows, like small towns like ours, and like up in the up in these areas where you've only got the one high school, and it's easy just to gravitate towards excitement and built and building towards uh, big things, and I think uh, the Dragons who missed out on the on the playoffs. Uh, by one game last year, uh, I think uh, they're well on their way to making a return. Uh, uh, for sure, RJ. Future is definitely bright in Dragon Country, uh, but that's not the only uh, head coaching change we had in the in in the area. Uh, Pickens County's arch rival, uh, the Gilmer County Bobcats. Uh, Coach Saunders uh, resigned, and uh, he's no longer there. Now we have uh, Coach Paul Standard, who leaves St. <coughs> Pius. Uh, and what a career uh, Coach Standard had at St. Pius uh, by going uh, 172 and – excuse me, 174 and 72, winning eight region championships at St. Pius. Uh, he now goes to Gilmer County and looks to continue the rebuild of the program. Uh, Jake, I know you've talked to uh, Coach Standard uh, – Talk to us about uh, oh, how things are going in Gilmer County and how uh, Coach Standard uh, looks to uh, rebuild the program. Jake, you got a copy? I believe he's on there. I think Jake's kind of having some audio problems right there. Uh, but Coach Standard, you know uh, – what what a career he had at St. Pius, uh, 174 and 72. I know he's uh, bringing his son uh, to coach as well. Uh, I believe his son uh, is also the offensive coordinator. So, yeah. Gilbert County plays in a tough region uh, with Dawson County, North Hall, uh, West Hall, Lumpkin, uh, White County, a uh, very tough region uh, for uh, – for the Bobcats, uh, the future's bright again. Where they've got a lot of middle school, they've got some good middle school teams and a young freshman class. I know they've got a good coaching staff there at Gilmer. Uh, just hope they can uh, hold on and continue that uh, that rebuild. <coughs> so, uh, moving right along here, we will uh, briefly talk about a uh, uh, Tennessee uh, Region Three One A Coach Spargo, Coach Stone. Uh, Vic Ryder leaves South Pitt, uh, goes to Cahula Creek to be an assistant coach. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Go ahead, John. Um, I'm sure that everybody else in the region is glad he's gone, but I'm not sure the replacement is is a whole lot better for everybody. Uh, but I, I think he'll do a great job down there. He did a great job at South Pitt, and I, and I think Chris Jones is going to just pick it right up and, and take it on and, and – uh, maybe even better than before. So uh, I, think, I think it's a good move for both parties. I know it's kind of funny. There's not many uh, single-A high schools in the state of Tennessee that goes to the Cleveland Browns and, uh, <laughs> and picks up their head coach, right, John? Yeah. I mean, I, I think Chris Jones is going to do a great job. Uh, former former uh, South Pittsburgh uh, pirate himself. Um, Vic, uh, you know, I, I, I think Vic's tried this a couple of times, hadn't he? And, uh, I, I just, you know, he's another guy just like, uh, coach Gentry and, and, uh, coach, uh, coach, uh, Allison, uh, that he just, uh, you know, that program down there just wins. And uh, I know some years ago I went down there to uh, interview for a, a job, an assistance job. And uh, when I sat down with, with Coach Grider, you know, he, he started talking about goals of the program and uh, their goals, their, their goals of their program started with week three of the playoffs, you know. Uh, we don't talk about winning the region. We don't talk about, you know, how many games we're going to win. We, you know, what are we going to do to get to the semifinals of the 
of the state playoffs. And those guys, you know, it, it, it's a it's a great atmosphere. You go down there today, and 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 it's all about South Pittsburgh football. And we we've sat here and talked about the the culture that that these coaches in Georgia and North Carolina are building. Um, you go down there and. And uh, it, it's unbelievable. It's the schools set right down in town, and uh, coaches in the office. The kids come by and sit down after workouts, and they, you know, coach, what, what we got? You know, what can we do today to get better? And uh, I, it just very, it, it was very impressed, uh, an, an impressive uh, environment down there. Uh, it's not an easy place to win. Uh, for an opponent, but, uh, you know, uh, we have had successes down there, but uh, I, I think uh, South Pittsburgh's just going to – they're going to revamp and uh, they'll be right back in there again. And, uh, again, uh, I'd like to wish Coach Grider uh, best wishes over at Cahula Creek. He's over there with uh, Coach Wilson, right? John? Yes. Is he is he there with Coach Coach Wilson still at Cahula Creek? Yes, he is. So yeah. they, those guys, those guys will. Uh, I know he Coach Wilson was a, a little frustrated with Cahula Creek a few years when we scrimmaged them, but uh, he uh, those guys will get, well, they'll get that program on his feet. Yep, I think so too, Coach. But uh, that's that's. Uh, there's another hard shoes to fill, but I think if, if, if you can fill them, South Pittsburgh is where you can fill them at. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just moving right along in the region, uh, Jake, good to have you back. Welcome to technology. It happens. Uh, Upper Basin, uh, losing a lot, losing a lot, losing Grabowski, losing Rollins, uh, you know, and you, Coach, Coach Stone, Coach Barr, I know you guys have been around the conservation program. Uh, there's a lot of coaching changes in the region. I think Whitwell's coach is now gone too. So uh, a lot of turnover in the region. Uh, South Pitt obviously still the favorite. Uh, looks Looking like Joe Boggs, I believe, is going to take over at quarterback for the Cougars. Uh, tough schedule. You know, we talked about that. And I, me and Jake talked about it in the schedule show. You've got Megs County, Fanning County, South Pitt. I mean – I think Copper Basin arguably has the toughest schedule in our, in our area. Well, I don't think there's any question about it. And, you know, in addition to, you know, Grabowski and Rollins, they also lost Timmy Fair, who made a lot of plays on defense. You know, Dawson Worthy, who made a lot of plays, um, and others. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be tough. I think Joe will be fine. Um, I think they're going to probably have to lean on the tailback, Sebastian Belisles. But, uh, and, but again, like, you know, like in all situations, they got to get that offensive line fixed. And they've got some young, big kids. So hopefully they can get that fixed. But I think that's where it's going to start for this team. You know, uh, is, is Megs County still on their schedule, John? Yes. See, Megs County, they were in the, they were in the, the state championship game last year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're, they're to the point, and, I, and I've been there. And I don't know how many players they got or anything like that. John will probably tell you, but you losing losing that kind of of people, you know, with Grabowski and Rollins and and all those guys, Worthy and those guys that you named, that's tough on that program. Just to yes. bounce right back, and uh, you know, there I don't know the numbers or anything like that, but I I know one thing. Uh, uh, if I lost Grabowski to graduation, I would feel I would feel very comfortable with uh, Joe Boggs coming in and being the quarterback. You know, one of the games we hyped up last year was McMinn Central and Copper Basin. As we bring in West Dunkel, and, and the the week before, the week before, you know, Grabowski what tears his ACL? Is that that? Yeah, he was yeah. out of that game. Yeah. Then Bob's gets hurt in the ball game, and you know it was just there. There was nothing they could do. I mean, they were you could tell at halftime they were they were just you know having quarterback tryouts down in the end zone. Uh, <laughs> I said, Tim. I just texted him. I said, if Grabowski is healthy, 
Central doesn't really have a chance in that ball game. You know, looking back, Central's defense had given up so many, so many yards to, to those air raid type offenses. If Grabowski's healthy, you put him with with Bilal's at tailback, and Central really doesn't have a chance in that ball game. But I, you know, I just, you know, I know, I know they're going to work at it. I don't know who they've got coming in. Uh, to replace those guys, uh, you know, I know Joe Boggs will will do a good job, but uh, I mean, just right in the middle of the season, that whole thing just crumbled. You know, yeah, he really did. I mean, he, he loses Boggs in the Central game, lost Grabowski in the game before. And, you know, it just uh, it, it crumbled, and and every coach, you know, hopes and prays every day that that doesn't ha- happen to him. But well, you know, too, coach, they put in. Uh, after Joe got hurt, I think they put Dawson Worthy in at quarterback, and he got hurt. Yeah, they did. It was just uh, – it was a nightmare. But you just uh, – you know, today, you know, today we're going to make it through. Everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be back together, you know. And uh, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. And I agree with Wesley. I The video I saw, I thought they would uh, – with Grabowski, they would give Central a fit. And uh, I really didn't – I wasn't sure that Central could beat them after I saw a video of both teams. But, you know, and then all of a sudden it goes – it just goes straight downhill. That's that's why you play them. That's why you play them. That's why why you work out every day. Yep. Jake, you got anything to add uh, about Copper Basin? I know we've we've got a new Copper Basin reporter, so – (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he put out a we put out a preseason preview for what to expect from this Copper Basin team. I mean, you guys pretty much hit it on the head. They're young, um, but I talked to Grabowski when I was talking to him about the seven on seven. Chad, the, the head coach, he said that um, I mean they've had a lot of struggles this off season, but the guys that are there and that that are showing up every day are are, are really wanting to compete. And sometimes uh, in, a, in a school that small, that's all it really takes um, is just guys that want to compete um, for your for your team to be right in there um, at the end vying for a playoff spot. So I, I, there's no reason, um, like, like you guys said, there's no reason Boggs can't take this team over. And, and, and I'm not going to say they won't miss a beat um, if things work out, but they, there's no reason they can't be right up there um, contending at the end. You know it, it, that is copper the the copper basin situation. I coached there the first two years as a as a in coaching, and John will tell you this. We had about forty five players. You know, we as a as an offensive line coach, I had I had nine offensive linemen that I would start any Friday night. Uh, we had we had uh, we had uh, literally. Nine running backs. Now, now we would have probably dropped some at quarterback if we lost Eddie Graham. But you know, we had forty-five players, and and I know those first two years of me coaching and being the defensive coordinator and offensive line coach. You know, I wasn't I wasn't that worried about it. Okay. Eight years later, when I went back there as a coach and the company as a head coach and the company had shut down, we were, you know, we were lucky to have 30 players, you know, and we were, you know, we had six offensive linemen and the sixth guy, you got to, you got to be able to center, right guard, left guard, left tackle, right tackle, you know, stuff like that. And that's, that's, that's the, that's the weakness there that you have. And, uh, you know, we were talking about South Pittsburgh a little bit late, a little while ago. They got, so they've still got 50 players. They're still making them iron skillets down there in South Pittsburgh. And there's a lot of kids coming in there. But, you know, it, it was different. When I went back there as a head coach, it was different. Uh, we, you know, we had one fullback and one tailback and, and you know, that sort of stuff. And we were young, but uh, I think uh, Coach Grabowski will will do well with this and develop this football team. Yeah. Uh, real quick, uh, before we end our show, of course, we're going to bring in West Uncle, who's a statistician, and uh, 
radio for uh, McMahon Central, uh, and I know Coach Stone and Coach Sparrow can talk about this, but, uh, you know, Matt Moody was named McMinn Central head coach, left Bradley Central, I believe, was the OC there. Uh, so what an addition for McMinn Central. Oh, it's it, a big-time, big-time addition. Um, surprisingly, there was a lot of names that, that you know, the put in put in for the job. Um, I know athletic director Brent Massengale did a good job. He interviewed a lot of people, um, really went through the head coaching, you know, the, the list that, that put in. Coach Moody comes over from Bradley Central where he was offensive coordinator. He, you know, if you, if you know anything about Bradley Central football, they throw it around. They've got athletes all over the field. So this offense at Central's coming from the wing tee where it was a, you know, a, a three yards in a cloud of dust offense to, hey, we're going to swing it out. We're going to run swing passes. We're going to throw screens. Then we're going to, hey, we're going to beat you down the field with, with that speed on the, on the offense. You know, you lose a guy like, like Jace Derrick last year where in that Copper Basin game, he he might have had 150 yards on about 35 touches. And he was just ground and pound. He's going to get three yards, and he's going to hit one every once in a while. But now you're going to have guys like Darius Carden on the outside. Jarrell Arnwine is back. You've got three good young running backs. Clint Roberts, a sophomore. You saw him very little last year as a freshman. And then you've got you know guys like Harley McCormick, also another running back. They're going to use that speed, get on that, get on the edges, and then they may hit you, you know, up the middle a few times. But this offense is going to be fun to watch. A, a true four-five wide spread offense that's going to help that offensive line a lot too. Coming from the wing, wing T, where it was a lot of schemes, a lot of pulling, a lot of, you know, hard nosed stuff. Offensive line played where that offensive line really wasn't fit for that being anywhere from you know, five nine to six two and two hundred and sixty pounds. I mean, you got guys like me out there playing offensive line. That would help, you know, but Central's not a big school. They don't have a big line. This spread offense is gonna help that offensive line, wouldn't you think there, uh, Coach Stone? Oh, I think so. I today you cannot play football like you played in the seventies and eighties. You you know uh, the game, and, and I'm not, I'm not bashing anybody for what they do. So don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm a believer in doing, making changes. Change if you have to change your philosophy a little bit, uh, do it. But I, I'm a believer in this spread offense. But I think it was the Signal Mountain game last year. Signal Mountain would get the ball you know, two plays, and they would score. You know, they would kick off to Central, you know, 10 plays, you know, 10 plays, and they would have to kick the ball, you know, punt the ball back. And it's just not – I mean, you can't play that way. Used to when both teams were playing that way, but I think if you're, if you're going to get in a, in a wing tee offense, something like that, even today uh, – like Polk County ran the split back veer last year. You can't do that unless you're gonna you're gonna grind it out for eight, nine minutes score, and then you've got a defense that's gonna take it right back over. You can't you can't get two scores down and expect to, you know, to to do that. And uh, you know, Jace Jace Derrick was a great foot uh great uh, running back. Uh but you you just can't I, there's just no place in football. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, McMahon Central is going to like this. Uh, I, I really do. Uh, but I, I just, I, you know, I hope, I hope they can, I hope they can do it. And I think it'll put some fans in the seats and, uh, but I think it'll make them a better football team. You, you go back to, to my sophomore and junior year of, of high school, 2015, 2016, there were some good central football teams. One, you know, my junior year or my sophomore year, we go nine and three. We go to the third round of the playoffs, lose to a good Notre Dame team to, who had about 10 Division One commits. One was a wide receiver that went to Arizona State. That was a spread offense. You know, Coach Gooden had a good spread offense. You had Jackson Guy who went to, you know, played Division One football. You had Jackson Long, a running back, and went and played some NAIA ball. But 
you spread it out, it puts so much more pressure on the defense. That wing T, you know, you had 10 guys in the box. You had 10 guys in the box. You had maybe one guy deep for that trick pass that they would throw one or two times a game. But that wing T, you're, you're stacking the box, spread, you're, you're, you've got guys all over the field, and it opens up lanes for that speed. You know, Coach Stone, you probably saw Jarrell Arnwine and Darius Carden and McCormick and all those guys last year. They've got speed. They've got home run speed. And if you get them in space with a little bit of blocking, things could, you know, turn, turn pretty fast. Well, the, the spread offense, uh, you know, uh, I guess one, one, one thing that defensive kids are not good at today is open field tackling. And you get them out there one on one, you know, you know, speed's going to win about nine out of 10 times. And uh, I, I just, I really think, uh, I think this is good. The bad part is they didn't have spring practice. I know they're probably working like crazy in the summer, but uh, it's just, it's going to take uh, finding a quarterback that can do this, you know. And uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that, that they can't run and catch the football. It's just going to be, you know, Gosh, that's a that's a big change. That is a big change. Tim, before you before before you wrap it up, Dunkel, I want to know we did on we did over under wins for all the teams on our schedule show. Of course, we didn't talk about Central. What's you what what's your guess over under wins for Central heading into this year? If I you know if I put a line on it, I would put it at four four and a half. Coming from the wing tee, that like like Coach Stump said, it's just such a big change. Um, I can tell you this: all the guys in the locker room have bought in. Their Coach Moody is a, a breath of fresh air. You know, he's really won the locker room. You've got a lot of kids that came out, a lot of new faces on the football team. But I would say four, four and a half, and and you know, you've still got to play McMinn County early in the year. You've got you know a, a, t- a decently tough region. You know, Meigs County's in there. So, I would put it about four, four and a half. But this team could surprise some people. You know, you've definitely got the offense to, you know, that that's a more modern offense now. And the defense should be should be fairly decent. Uh, Coach Maskell is probably more than likely going to take over the defense. So, you put speed on the on the perimeter of the defense, and the, you know, that's a winning, winning combination. You know, one of, <clears throat> one of my biggest pet peeves, if I was a head coach, if I became a head coach today, you guys wouldn't talk about the spread offense to me, but for just a minute. I would talk about we're going to put somebody out there to get them stopped, and then we're going to do this other stuff. You know, and, and I, I get so aggravated at some of these head coaches. Like they, they say, well, we're going to be in the spread offense. We're going to score 42 points, but our defense is going to give up 56 points. You see what I'm saying? And and, and I've I've thought about it. I, I've I, I, I talked to a head coach not long ago. Coach, put defense first, and then and then this other stuff's going to take care of itself. And uh, you know, I just I I just think. Uh, you you look at places. Look at Alabama. And, you know they they don't do a probably a true spread, but that game they're going to beat you to death on on defense. Georgia is going to do that. You know, and you know I'm going to I'm going to if if ever if I I don't want you talking to me about our spread offense. What it's going it's going to be cute and everything. I love it. I grew up as a coach, started out with a split back veer at Copper Basin, went to the wing tee, went to the double wing, coached uh, Georgia Tech offense at Fannin, went to the sp- uh, spread offense, come back, uh, you know, doing all sorts of things. But you got to get them stopped. And I, you know, I'm not going to talk to you a whole lot about uh, uh, as a coach, we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going we're gonna to have a great defense. And uh, it's, it's just like I said, I, I felt like Central's weakness last year was it took them so long to score, and their defense, which was decent, 
you know, the other team go down the field two or three plays and score, you know, and then and then the other team had it back. If you if you guys had been there at the uh, at the Signal Mountain game, it was it was it was that it, it was almost you wanted to stay in the huddle and take a take a twenty five second uh, delay a game penalty to slow the game, you know, but you couldn't do it. Well, guys, we're, uh, you know, this this show's titled the off season, so obviously none of us have given any predictions. We're going to have so many prediction shows uh, with with FIN Sports with Jake, and uh, you know, it's here, guys. We're we're less than we're less than thirty days away from the first scrimmage, so I mean, that's how close we are. Uh, I, I'm excited about. It. I know everybody else is. Uh, definitely like to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, Friday night press box on FIN Sports. Uh, we're going to be on, on Facebook and Twitter on, on Team FYN Sports' live stream. Uh, we're also still going to be available on all podcast platforms. So you can still catch us on there just by searching the Friday Night Press Box podcast on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, on all that. But uh, I think this was, this was a great show. We could have talked for three hours, really, about about everything that's happened in the offseason as much as we love football. So uh, stay tuned to the social media pages. We're going to have a lot more uh, – Content coming out. Uh, it's going to be a great season. Anybody got any final thoughts before we before we close? It's uh, here, huh? It's here. It's here. I just want to throw out, you know, uh, Jake and uh, Chris. You know, their backgrounds are awesome. Those trees in the background. I mean, I, that that's awesome. Uh, you know, we, the rest of us going to have to start looking for some background stuff to. Put in that upgrade. <laughs> great to be on, guys. Football's here. Yeah, it's here, Coach. Great, great, to, great to see everybody. Uh, just follow our social media pages for more information. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. We'll see you later. All right, thank you.